been a, a big music fan for a long time, and I can remember when the grunge movement started in Seattle, the bands that came out of Seattle. And I was a big fan of this band called Soundgarden. Uh, you know, it wasn't the music I grew up on really, but there was something about Chris Cornell's voice, the songwriting, just everything about that music. I was a little young to be a huge Soundgarden fan when they first came out, but I remember in the early 90s, my sister was a huge grunge fan and definitely listened to Soundgarden a lot. Um, but when I started first becoming a huge fan of Chris Cornell was when I heard Like a Stone on the radio, um, the Audio Slave song. Um, and I just remember like kind of being frozen and having to drop everything I was doing because like the song was just so touching and his his vocal mixed with the lyric is so powerful. It's just like, I still get chills when I listen to it. I'd heard of Chris, I'd heard of Soundgarden only through my friends. And it was when Chris passed that um, I decided I was going to find out who this guy is because uh, he was important. I wasn't like a Soundgarden fan. It wasn't my thing. But that guy, that guy, I've never heard anything that he did even before I started digging into the volume of his work that didn't sound really truly authentic to me. Uh, authentically human, authentic human experience, authentic stories. And I was fortunate in my day job as a lawyer, doing what I do, I was fortunate, his misfortune led to my fortune uh, in terms of getting to meet him because Chris and Vicki Cornell had an insurance problem. But as that litigation progressed, I got to know Chris better. And eventually we resolved that uh, had the opportunity to work with Chris again, and then he agreed to do a private show for us, um, the first of two shows for us at the Roxy Theater. I actually got to see Chris Cornell play at the Roxy in, in Hollywood in 2017. Um, he played with a band, and it was a fantastic show, but the, the most memorable thing about the show was when he picked up this acoustic parlor-style guitar and basically just serenaded the audience solo for like an hour. So he had already played for like an hour and a half with the band. And then he just picks up his guitar and he serenades the audience for like an, another hour, just like his voice soaring and everyone's just like mesmerized. Anyway, it was, it was a really incredible experience and it was the only time I've ever gotten to see him live. So that was powerful and, I'm, and I feel lucky to have gotten to see that performance. Incomparable is a really good word. It is without compare. There's no one else there to compare it to. In terms of, um, you know, he could have sung the phone book and brought us all to tears. He's that kind of a voice. He's that kind of a talent. And that's part of what goes straight into the once in a lifetime um, artist. Um, and much as I love Chris Cornell's music, Chris Cornell, the person, that's what was truly inspiring. You know, um, I stayed in touch with Chris as a friend. I talked to him about his projects and his contracts and things like that. We talked about the prospect of doing something together musically. Um, and I had an artist in mind at the time that I thought would be perfect for a duet. I heard that he liked my music. Um, that kind of like had me like twinkling around on my toes for several months. <laughs> that was pretty exciting. In that week, I was talking to Chris Monday or Tuesday. And I said, Chris, I know you love Jennifer Magnus. He said, yeah, I love her version of that. He said, I think John Fogarty would love it if he's ever heard it. Uh, she's terrific. It's great. And I said, well, I want to talk with you. Uh, and I'm going to send you something. I would love to see if we could talk about you um, duetting with Jennifer on this great track. And he said, send it to me. Well, that was the Monday, Tuesday of the week that they played in Detroit. And it was in Detroit that night that Chris Cornell died um, two days later. You know, when that, that dark night came in, in Detroit um, three years ago now, it was um, a surprise to me. To have that kind of reaction from people, I mean tears, when my best friend's carver friend of mine was distraught 
crying his eyes out. And I just went, what have I missed here? So when it came time to think about doing a series of singles, a series of songs that would benefit his legacy in the form of the Chris and Vicki Cornell Foundation, I knew we had to get it right. This is not a world where you get a second chance. You know, if you put out music that doesn't do justice to the person who you're trying to honor, you're trying to respect, you're trying to remember, you have to do it right. Any singer that's worth anything listens to the melodies that Chris Cornell crafted and backs up. Like, wait a minute. You did not just sing that. Yes, he did. Yeah, you can't forget talking about Chris is, is the range, his range and abilities, you know, abilities of like being down like in the basement and all of a sudden like, you know, attic <laughs> and like so clear and pure, you know, that the notes are so clear and pure. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really weird. There's no whole record balance to keep in mind or it doesn't have anything to do with what you want to tell the world. This is a little personal thing between the artist and the subject of the tribute. It's beautiful. So what do we hope to do with this? We hope to remind people of what a terrific musician Chris Cornell was, what a great writer he was. We hope to reintroduce people to Chris that maybe have let his memory slide a little bit. We hope to introduce a new audience to our new versions of Chris Cornell songs. We hope to increase the profile of the Chris and Vicki Cornell Foundation. Most of all, we hope we make Chris proud with what we've done with his music. He gave us a great starting point. We've tried to live up to it. When you listen to these songs, I hope you agree that our artists have done a pretty good job of honoring Chris Cornell. <laughs>